I guess Jeff's mic is off, so I guess I'll start talking away here. What we're going to talk about a little bit tonight is getting ready for springtime and um, get the people to start making their own queens. And I think Jeff probably have to drop out and hook back up. He's having trouble with the microphone. He's having trouble with his camera. But I'm going to show you uh, one of the easiest ways. Get you a frame. This is what I use for a starting frame. It's basically a medium, and it's easy to set your cells on. And what we do is we mount our own cells. I'll show you a frame. This is one. This is a three-frame one. Let's see. See it. Let me see. We try to put 15 to the row, three rows. This one was set up and never set in. And this is what you start out with. You start out with an empty frame like this, and each of these bars are removable. Now I'm going to show you this bar. You slide out. And you set these on your table when you're graphing. Now, this bar here is set up. Let me see if you can see it there. You see that slot in there? It doesn't have to be perfect. Some people like these. These are these little plastic cups. I don't know if people can see that. These backwards here. Okay, there's the little cup. Now, these other cups are wax cups. These, you just push them into your, your sawed out bar. See how those mount on there? You can mount 15 of these in a row. Now, we make our own wax cups. This is my little dipping. These are just basically doll rods, piece of wood. You see that? Just a little piece of wood. And let's see, everything's backwards here. I like to take these tips here, these doll rods, and just round them just a little bit with sandpaper, and then they come off better. Um, or the easiest way is to lift your, your box or your hive, make their own queen cells. But <clears throat> my whole method of making everything yourself is to save you money. You don't need to buy everything you see at the store. Now, I'm going to start showing you some of these things. I know there's people out there that's going to laugh. You see this? Let's see. This is basically, can you see the tip of that? This is a piece of copper wire that I use for grafting. So don't let anybody tell you you have to buy everything in that catalog to make queens. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you, see, there's, here's one, and then here's the other one. And one is 12 gauge, the other one's 14 gauge. And what I've done, get this up close enough and you can see the tip of it. I just took a piece of copper wire, you see that tip there? Let me see it. All I've done was tap it down on a table saw or an anvil, flatten it out. I took the very tip. Can you see where it's tipped up just a little bit? I bend it up on a 15 degree angle. That allows you to get down and get a hold of that larva. Now, let me show you another one. These are little tricks that I've learned a long time ago. You don't need to buy a lot. This, I'm going to put my hand up where you can see it. This is a paper clip. See, turn it where you see, see where I bent the end of it? I tapped it down just a little bit to make a spoon. That goes up underneath it. Now, one of the easiest things to use, and it's very cheap, this is the Chinese grafted needle. I'll pull the end off. You want to keep the ends covered. I'll show you the end, how flexible they are. See how this here kind of bends up? Now, I suggest these things are normally about a dollar to a dollar fifty. If you're going to buy this method, these are very cheap. I usually buy 15 or 20 of these, and out of 20, you might find one or two 
that's actually flexible that you can use. Now, let me get all this other stuff over here. And I know there's a lot of people just like me. You see, I'm wearing glasses now. I'm going to show you these glasses. These glasses here are just over-the-counter readers. Get the highest magnification you can get. And these, you can see good. I have a large magnifying glass in the, in the B lab back there. Plus, Harbor Freight sells headbands with glasses that have magnifiers in it. And with that, just about a blind person can graph. But if a person just wants to make a few queens, I say look at the videos, either cut them out or you can just cut a strip out. I've done probably six videos on how to make queens very easily. Now, if Jeff is back, he can open up the mics. And if someone's got questions, now's a good time to ask questions so we can kind of get this stuff going here. Is your mic and everything working now? It should be. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, good. We'll go ahead and open up the lines, and then you have questions. Give me one second here. Okay. Uh... All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. All righty, guys. Unmuted. You can unmute yourself by clicking on your microphone or by pressing star six, and it should unmute you. Anybody have any questions? Questions. You can also type them into the chat window and we'll answer them from there. Welcome, everybody. There's Joe. Here comes Joe Good on his evening, camera. <laughs> Joe, how are you? Are you? Can't hear you. <laughs> everybody seems to be bashful on here. There okay. he is. We Come hear you now. now. Hey, Don, on nukes, what do you uh, constitute a sellable nuke? Is that five draw frames with a land queen in there? Uh... <clears throat> well, the easiest question to, uh, to answer that is, whatever you see there, would you want to buy it? I like to see five frames draw it out. And three to maybe four, completely draw it out. The third or the fourth one could be partially or three quarter, but I like to see a lot of bees in there and I wanna see Queensland, I wanna see pollen, I wanna see honey. And if you've got a customer coming, is what I do here is if I have a customer come pick up a nuke is I have several. If they're picking up 10 or 15 nukes, I'll have double the amount. And I tell them before we open the first box, you look at it, you make your decision right there. If you don't like the color of the queen, you don't like the laying pattern, if there's anything about it, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I'll close it up and we'll get you a different one. But the main thing is have that customer happy. And I tell them, look at it. When you hit the road, those are your bees. I don't want to hear that they're not happy and you bring them back because people not uh, fastening them down. They drop them, they damage them, or they're not secure in their boxes, and you can have problems. But I hope that part answers your question. Look at the hive. If you would buy it, then it should be good. Okay. Well, I thought didn't know if it was a standard. You had to have all five frames drawn all the way not out. Not really. I mean, I've had people, I'll tell them ahead of time when we open a box, this is not as strong as I would like it, but the market is so uh, robust right now that you know people if it looks like a bee they'll buy it and uh the thing you want to think about is honesty in selling some uh an experienced beekeeper coming there uh you're not going to pull the wool over in his eyes but a new beekeeper as long as it's got some bees in there they're happy they'll buy it but you know it's going to come back to bite you later so treat everybody like you want to be treated and that's one reason I haven't advertised since 1970. And I send more business to most of my students than I can possibly send. How do you, can you tell these are small cell or not, but just looking at them? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a foundation here. And when I do uh, B clubs and I talk there, or if I have people that show up here, I'll take standard foundation that I've gotten some that from years ago. And I'll lay a piece of the standard foundation across the ones that I've made. And there's a definitely, you can see it. 
And anybody who's kept bees for a year or two, the first thing they notice when they walk up to my hives, they'll say, those are awful small looking bees. And then you explain to them because not everybody's informed about small cell bees. Well, I'm under the assumption that you keep uh, letting them draw their own comb and changing it out, that they'll revert to small cell if they're not small cell. Is that correct? Well, it depends on the queen. It depends on, you know, if you're feeding them and that. Um, it's best to have a minimum of two. If you're first starting on foundationless or letting them draw their own, is I would go at least every frame, at least a two-inch starter strip of small cell. And by having small cell queens that you've got, you know they're small cell, it's pretty much they're going to lay small cell bees. But now the only factor comes in there is if you have a good heavy honey flow, the top inch to three inches on a hot day with a heavy honey flow, if it starts to stretch down, they'll start reverting back to a bigger bee or they'll just make drones or they'll fill it with honey. Yeah, I've seen you do that fishing line on all your on your foundation. Do you do that on all of your hives out in the bee yard? Not really. Uh, that was mainly done so you don't have to wire uh, foundation. And it's mainly for support to hold that up if you're going to ship. Because most of the time, uh, if they drop the nuke in the post office, it's going to bust loose right at that honey band. Usually an inch to two inches of honey across under that top bar is the weakest part of that whole frame. So if they drop it, it's going to bust off. One more question. I'll get in there and let somebody else have it. Hey, I, this week has been warm here, and I've seen about uh, six or seven drones coming out of a hive. Is that left over from last year, or yeah. they haven't run mm -hmm. out? Yeah. Now that there, I haven't put words in your mouth, but a lot of people tell you that they run all the drones off. No, I, my whole philosophy of teaching bees is common sense beekeeping. And nature is not going to run every drone out of that hive. They have no way to replace that queen if something, you know, desperate would happen. So that is a self-explanatory type thing right there. You know, these people like to say they run all the drones out. You know, I wish I knew as much as they thought they did. Thank you, Don. Okay. Don uh, has a question about when is the best time to split before a honey flow or after a honey flow? Well, there, there's two main things about splitting is you got to have drones. The drones have to be old enough. You have to have pollen coming in or you're going to have to substitute uh, a pollen substitute. But uh, I would wait till you know you're going to have your last frost unless you've got a good, strong split. And if you're making weak splits, one frame or two frames, if the temperature drops below 55, they're going to cluster. And if they cluster away from the queen cell, the queen cell is going to get chilled and they're just going to die. All right. That sounds good. Uh, next question. Anybody want to unmute and ask it or you want to type it in the chat? It's going to be a short, uh, short episode here if we don't get a couple of questions. <laughs> I guess everybody must be intimidated, but, you know, that's why I'm here. I'm trying to teach people if they don't answer or ask questions, I can't answer them for them. Yep. Good evening, Jamie. You don't ship nukes anymore, do you, Don? I ship nukes if I have to, but I try to let my students ship them because they're trying to build their business. I'm trying to slow down. Yeah. You typically you ship them. You can jump on in there, Kelsey, and you can uh, you can ask questions. Uh, Jamie come over and he worked all day. I worked like a mule downstairs, and he was making foundation. So you can let uh, Joe May know what you're, he's in for. He's wanting to buy a wax mill. <laughs> I watched your video the other day. You said the wax mill was 2000? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got to turn your mic on there, James, Jamie. All right. Well, now? we've got a question from uh, Jim Murray here. He says, what is the best time to start grafting? 
And like I say, you've got to have those factors. You've got to have pollen coming in. You've got to have mature drones. Those are your two main things. And then temperature. You can make heavy uh, splits with a lot of bees and you can create enough heat, but you still got to have that, that uh, adult drone and you've got to have pollen coming in. Either open pollen in a frame or you got to have some fresh pollen coming in. Or you could stimulate it with artificial pollen, pollen substitutes. Evening, Jim. Jim is a student from Texas, and he comes over here and spends a week, two weeks at a time until I drive him off. <laughs> hey, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we, we can hear you, James. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, just get ready for that wax mill. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Don, Don worked me over pretty good. Did you have a lot of questions when you got home? <laughs> yeah, she had a few questions for me. It was a pretty good uh, experience that I really enjoyed the day. It, uh, you'll, learned learn, a bit. you'll learn something every time you come. Uh, no doubt. I'm, I'm just take a little bit at a time. It's a little overwhelming at first because there's a lot going on. Well, you know, when I when we was talking, I told you I have students that come from all over the United States. Joe May is from Indiana. I have another student I'm just above him there uh, from India, Indianapolis, Indiana. And I have uh, two or three from Illinois. Jim Murray on here, he's from uh, down below Austin, Texas. So I have them from all over and even out of, out of the United States that come here occasionally. But I'm not going to say I'm the best teacher. They're, they're just, they take taken because they can't find nobody else to teach them. There's nobody wants to teach the commercial beekeeping, I guess. Well, I'd like to say real quick that if you've got questions, Don can answer them for you. Don't be bashful. He's not going to bite your head off. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what I'm here. I see Daryl is, uh, Daryl Pounder, he come over to visit me. He's out of Arkansas, so there's... There's several states right now tonight that's being representative, but I guess um, might be Tim. And Ed, I believe, is from Pennsylvania, so we got a few states here. Don, uh, oh, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. I think what the guys about rearing the queens, like for instance, after the uh, drone got a bunch of drone cell caps, how long should you wait till you start making queen cells? Something like that. Well, coming up. You know, if you start to make queens and you're starting to see drones, you know, by the time that the queen comes out, you're going to have some drones old enough because they're not all going to be real young. When I start drones, that's when I start the grafting. If something dropped, I didn't hear that last. When, when did you say you started drafting? I start grafting as soon as I have drones in there or I see them starting to make drones. When you pull a frame out and you see the bees, when you start compacting them and put the feed to them, once they start to draw uh, drone cells, they're telling you they're going to start to swarm and, and it won't be long and they'll be making queen cells. That's when you want to keep going down all the way through the bottom board every 14 days. That way you catch them cells, cut them out, and make more splits. Uh, when, when you ship them, Newt, or your students ship them, they ship them in cardboard boxes, they ship them in wood boxes? Never ship in cardboard. I mean, I always built wood boxes. I might charge just a little bit more. I think they'd probably run five, ten dollars $10 more. But it's a box that when they get it, they can use it as a swarm catching box. I mean, they can hang it up in a tree or set it out somewhere, and they get swarms in them because it's already got a smell of bees and the, the wax, everything. And the cardboard boxes that they sell, they're about 11 or $12, and they're uh, sprayed with a wax paraffin, and it causes the, the hive or the nuke box to actually sweat in transit. So these are little problems I've run across over the years. So, you know, it takes a little longer for wood. Wood is a natural absorber, so it keeps the bees a lot better. Uh, question. It, Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Uh, I see Ed has got a thing about uh, the UPS can destroy a cardboard box. Not only that, the post office can destroy a wood box, too. I mean, the way we ship them out, you'd almost have to hit them with a tow motor. 
And from what I heard, they have dropped them off the back of, you know, trucks and stuff and crushed the box. So you got to pack them and insure them so you insure your product there. Uh, Jim Murray has a question about, he wants to know, how do I collect eggs and how do I place them? That's probably more of one of like one of your subjects or something, I think. Right, Don? Well, you don't really collect eggs. You want to collect a larva. And uh, in this little cell here, let's see if you can see it here. This here, when you dig down into here, this would represent a, a cell on a frame. Your egg is going to stand straight out. Once it starts to bend a little bit, it's starting on the second day. If it starts to make almost a C, then it's it's almost borderline to use. You want to get it when it starts to open up just a little bit. And if it makes a complete C, it's way too old. It's probably seven, eight days old. So you're not going to get a good queen. Now, it's I'm not going to say they won't make a queen out of it. But if you get it when it just starts to bend, that egg is straight. And when it just starts to bend, it's going on first, going into the second day, probably about probably 30 hours, 35 hours in that time frame, you get the best one. But if you don't have any eggs and you're grafting on these old ones that made a complete C, they will take that if there's no other eggs in there. They'll make a queen, but the queen will never get enough nourishment and develop fully. She'll either have bad wings on her or she won't get good mating. It's just they won't do it. But they're doing it as an emergency. You almost, if you can't graft that good, is just take a frame of eggs and drop it in there, a queenless hive, and then you know what you got. They will make, they can pick the best ones for you. Right, Don, that's one of your points is that they're sometimes a whole lot smarter than we are. Right. <laughs> they, know, they know us better than we do. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. All right, other questions? Nobody, huh? Well, you know, Don, I think I'm going to have a very early spring up here. Um, you know, we just hit our cold weather. We just had our first negative temperature up here in North Dakota, which usually, you know, last year was brutal right from November on. You know, October, December was just brutal with, with the negative polar vortex and all that last year. This year, I think we're going to have a really early spring and summer. So, Hopefully by April I'll be in bees. Um, we'll we'll see what happens. Well, it's possible, but in your area up there, you're going to get that sneaky drop down freeze. You know, all the way up. I would say to the first of May. So really, you know, lots of people they you know they get that warm weather coming in and they get the bee fever. They get out there, they start doing a lot of things, the and then the temperature drops and they get that depressed feeling because they've lost so much. They, you know, it's a lot of effort to set all these boxes and stuff up, do your grafting, and lose it all because of the cold weather. So don't get too anxious. Well, this is my first set of bees um, coming out of Wisconsin, actually. Uh, so I figured, you know, the guy who does it in Wisconsin's got a pretty good reputation. He's got cold weather. He's got bees that are adapted to the region. You know, Wisconsin's not exactly a uh, tropical paradise. So, <laughs> so yeah, I will see. He, he he says the bees should be ready by April. Oh, we have a question here from James. Can you give the inside dimensions for a deep hive box and a medium box? He'd like to know the dimensions. Um, well, I don't really have – you'd have to take off uh, an inch and a half, I guess, because we're basing it on three-quarter lumber. And what I am working with is outside dimensions. Across the front on a nuke box is nine and a quarter. And it's, I make mine nine and seven eighths high. And the side pieces, now your end pieces, that's nine and a quarter. You set your daddy blade or your router, whatever you're using, and run a three quarter edge around all three sides, just like a drawer front. And then the pieces that go on the side are called your side pieces. Those are 19 and one eighth. And they're nine and seven eighths high. Now, the inside, if you're using standard wood, it's probably going to be an inch and a half smaller. I hope that makes sense, Jamie. Any 
Any other questions, guys? We're at the halfway marker. <laughs> Half time report. <laughs> <laughs> Don, how how did the uh, you were talking about getting some videos together, making some videos down in the basement on wax? Did, did that work out or no? I I actually I shot one down there. I had some good uh, emails on it, and on Facebook I had some good. <laughs> uh, and one of my students had stopped over here. I figured he would jump in here tonight. Uh, what I've done is I've set my laptop up downstairs, and then I got a tripod, and the camera that I have to mount on the tripod doesn't belong on it, so I, I kind of taped it up with duct tape, and then I had to focus on dipping wax and uh, cooling it with the sheets. And then after I did a few of those, then I had to stop and then walk over and then set the camera up to focus on the wax mill. And then I'd run that a little bit, and that was his comment that, you should have had one of your students there just moving that camera around and, you know, kind of helping you because I was broadcasting on Google and we had people dropping and you could see where I had people there, but they was reluctant to ask questions or they felt intimidated. I don't know what it is, but, you know, that is one thing, you know, don't get intimidated. I'm just another guy keeping bees. I've made more mistakes than most people and I'm here to try to help other people. Keep them from making mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's got a learning curve. So if you don't ask the question, you're not going to get an answer for it. Don, you ever think about getting a, a GoPro camera to put on your head? Well, no. I have a bloggy camera, which uh, when I went to the tech store down there, I told them my situation. I said, I'm an old fart. I can't, I'm not high tech. And I said, I want to shoot videos in, in the bee yard and that. And he says, you get this blogging camera. And he said, it's made for old people. And you just point it, push the button, and it starts recording. And when you get done, you push the button, it stops. And then you flip the little lever out and you plug it into your PC and it just uploads to uh, Facebook or YouTube. So it's one of those no brainer ones. Now, I did a video with a, I guess it was a GoPro with a standing video camera where we shot two videos at the same time. And one of them was mounted on my head and we was working inside of a, a beehive and we was using the other camera filming at the same time. So you had two views. Now, I had good things uh, said about it and I had bad things. Some people said it just made them dizzy looking from one screen to the other trying to keep up with it. And other people said they thought it was very interesting. Uh, what I would like to do is probably get more students involved to where they want to do the videos. Uh, I try to shoot videos with all my students, try to get them uh, so people recognize them. It sort of helps get them in business. But there's some people just camera shy. My son's that way. He doesn't like getting videotaped. <laughs> Jim Murray's got a question for you here, uh, Don. Go ahead, Jim. Hey, Don. When when you make your after you get your sheets of wax made, you dry them and keep them sealed up for storage. I never dry them. I when I dip them, I just stack them up. That's all I I do with it for storage. Before you put them in frames, if you're going to store a, make up a bunch of them and store them, do you keep them uh, airtight or anything? No, if you keep them airtight, they're going to sweat, they're going to mold. Because when you run them through that mill, you're going to have a little more moisture on them. And I've got stacks of them down there now that's 12, 14 inches high. I've probably got uh, 10 stacks down there right now. I'm probably up to about 2,000 sheets right now and about halfway, you know, to finish up. No, what's your that, wax? that is a lot of wax. That ain't no wax. <laughs> video there on the wax the other day, Don. Uh, could, when you uh, release that uh, sheets off into the, the release water, right. you just not that release water, do you get 40 or 50 of them and then go and take them out and start doing the, the milling process later, or does that cause a problem? Well, you can, but what you see on the, the dipping in the hot wax, you have to maintain probably 178, 182, somewhere in there. That's most ideal for dipping your wax. Now, you can run down to 174 to 176. The wax is cooler, 
And by using the same board, same techniques, you almost get twice the wax on that board. Now, it's just the reverse over there in the dipping section. If you let that wax cool down more than about 98, 90, you know, 96, say, uh, it's more brittle. The easiest way to explain that is if you step on ice outside, it shatters. When that wax is too cool, it's brittle. And it's got like crystals in it. And the crystals is very, uh, they're fragile. But if you take that sheet and laid it down on a table flat and took a rolling pin and rolled it just a little bit, you break up the crystals and it's pliable. That's what happens when you're running it through this wax embosser. All it's doing is crushing the wax a little bit and it's imprinting the wax whatever cell size you want. But your temperature, you almost have, well, you can, I run it by basically feel. But you could throw a thermometer in there. If the if you run your wax hotter, you can make thin sheets. The wax mill, you've seen the picture of it. You see me use it without making any adjustments. I can let the temperature of the wax get a little hotter. I can run from four sheets to six sheets on deeps, or I can let it get warmer or hotter, and I can run it all the way up to 22 sheets without making no adjustments to the machine, just by temperature. And you did put soap on your mill before you uh, started? I usually put about a quarter of a teaspoon of dishwashing soap. I try to get the cheapest, the least perfumey, and there's probably a quart and a half of water underneath the rollers. And in the water dipping bath is a big uh, Rubbermaid tub, and we usually start out with about maybe less than a quarter of a teaspoon of, of uh, soap in there. Because when we put our board in there and uh, we let it soak for a little bit, we turn it over and we probably put a, just a couple little squirts on there. It wouldn't even probably be 15, 20 drops. And we just spread it all around the board. And we hold it there and let it sit a little bit because oak dipping board is porous. And when that soap gets into pores, it's just a good release agent. It's just like the metal. If it's metal is wet, it won't stick. But if it's dry, it's going to stick. Yes, sir. <laughs> Don, uh, got a question from Ed. He wants to know about how many sheets of do you make in a year? Well, I used to, uh, before I bought my wax mill back in 90, 90 or 91, I would go anywhere from 300 to 500 pounds of wax. Trade it in, and then, you know, you stand there, you hand them the wax, they weigh it, and they hand you boxes already made. But you don't know what you're getting back. So we probably, we're making these wheels, which we do in five-gallon buckets. And they're probably eight inches, nine inches across. And they're probably that much deep. The wheels run anywhere from <laughs> to maybe nine and a half pounds. We usually, I think the last time I checked, I had 38 wheels. I think I'm down about 12 wheels now. So, you know, I'm constantly melting and and I'd be have people bring wax to me too. So how many sheets does that work out in about a year, do you think, roughly? Uh well right now I've probably got at least a couple thousand down there right now. I mean I've already got, you know, pre orders out for four to five hundred nukes. Uh so each nuke is five frames, you know, so you got five sheets or if you got a good heavy honey flow. You're going to go with a minimum of three sheets and starter strips, which is going to be a two-inch strip. Well, that answers that question. Um, and then there's another question along the lines of wax. How many sheets from a pound of wax would you would you get me that you get on your, the way you do it? Well, I'm running my wax. Uh, I don't know. Several people, I guess, have been on here probably could tell you. I run my wax, and if I hand you the sheet of wax, you swear you're holding a piece of plastic foundation. Uh, the the B supply houses rate theirs on deeps, and it's seven to eight to eight and a half sheets to the pound. That's how they rate theirs. And I could probably rate mine between four and five sheets to the pound. And, you know, it's sometimes you can make it thinner. But sometimes you're better off to make it thicker and don't have it buckle over on you or stretch. Right, because you have a heat, 
you have a heat issue there in the south and a moisture issue and and everything else kind of hot and muggy so so yeah. it's better to be thicker is what you're saying yeah one thing i found uh i used to worry about it trying to get it as thin as possible make this wax go as long as possible but by making it thicker the bees will actually rework some of it and they'll remove some if it's too thick they're smarter than what we are and they will just dis distribute it all through the hive because i've noticed that where i put new foundation where new uh, wax that was rolled and maybe have an old piece over there you know on the other side of the hive and you get to look at it in a few days and you'll see where they've already changed some of that wax from one point to the other they move it around they thin it out they rework it right it's so it's better to leave it thick and let them do what they want with it i guess yeah if you've got the wax you can uh you know afford to do it it's probably better to make them a little bit thicker uh when i have students over here we probably run in six to seven sheets average uh some of the students when they're a little slower they're probably going to get four or five sheets to the pound but it doesn't really matter you know you you can average that stuff out if you just keep the dipping water warmer the warmer that water is keeps that wax warm when it goes through those mills there it's they're preset at a certain thickness so if it's a thick piece or you got a big old clump or a bu uh, a bubble of wax there it'll flatten it out and just even it out clear across there that probably answers your question about how many sheets could you put in your water before you could run the wax mill. If it's too cold, it's going to be a lot harder to run it through there. Right. Okay, so the next question is from Willie Bryant. Uh, when do you start feeding your bees in your area, Don? As soon as they'll take it. You know, I start... I look at the trees. Uh, when I start seeing the dandelions and the red maples blooming, then I get myself in high gear. The more you feed them, the more wax they're going to make. And even if you got cross comb, I don't care what it is, I can cut it out, throw it in a bucket, and let them just rob that honey out, and they're going to just recycle it in the wax. So it's either going to turn into honey, or it's going to turn to wax, or they're going to use it to make brew. All right. Well, now James has got a question about milling your lumber on the sawmill how thick do you cut your boards to begin with um he's talking about running it through a planer after it dries you probably buy pre-made pre-done you know lumber i guess i don't Who, know me yeah no i think about no pre -la. my pre uh pre-finished wood is still growing with tree limbs on it and uh, leaves so my sawmill has got a scale on it. So when I'm running the sawmill, I drop down on the scale and it's set for uh, three quarter, four quarter, five quarter, whatever you want. So if I'm setting my own blades, which I'm doing, and I sharpen my own blades, I'm setting my blades so it removes sawdust, which is called the kerf. It goes through and it's removing sawdust. I'm pulling out 16 thousandths. Now, the sawmill originally was set up at 23 thousandths so the scale is based on that if you set it at three quarters and you're running at uh, 23 thousandths kerf it's going to run real close but if you running like i'm doing a lot less i'm probably running about 18 16 somewhere in sometimes 17. now i'm pulling a lot less uh sawdust out there so i leave more material on it my boards come off that sawmill are going to run three quarters to 13 16 and sometimes maybe close to seven eighths. So rather than do a lot of work for nothing, I air dry them and then I run them through the planer and I set the planer at three quarters and one time through there, plane the outside. And that's only to uh, for you have a better paint adhesion. The rougher it is on the inside, the bees like it better. You could that, use that's it. That's a good well. point. That's a good point. Yeah, the rougher the the rougher the lumber on the inside, the more kind of splintery it, the easier it is for them to attach stuff to it. If they get a three dimensional surface rather than a two dimensional surface. Well, what happens with the bees? Uh, even if you buy store bought lumber, if you if you have bees, you pop, you know, you'll know it. If you don't have bees, you don't know what I'm talking about. But you could take a brand new box in there and go back in three or four months. And they take propolis and they start 
filling in some of the pores and it gets slick in there and you know sometimes in corners get sticky they fix that box up inside and uh, a smooth surface compared to a rough surface the bees actually do better on that rougher surface and here's another question. Um, when you put in your starter strips, and he's talking about small cell starter, starter strips, mm-hmm. uh, do the bees follow that pattern as they go down, or will they make cells larger as they build it down, in your opinion? Well, if you've got a starter strip in there with small cell, they're going to follow that. The exception to the rule, if the hive is getting crowded, is getting honey bound, those are the two indicators right there. Halfway down that frame, they'll start drawing some drone comb because it's getting crowded. They're going to make drones to swarm, so they use a larger cell. Usually, your stretched or your large cells come right underneath the top bar. The bars that go across the top, when you get honey in there, the heat from the outside and the sun in that hive, and if there's not enough bees, the weight of the honey starts to stretch downward, and you get an elongated uh, cell there, not a good hexagon. So when they get that, they got two choices, honey or drone. And they'll put the drones sometimes at the top, but more than likely they're going to use it for a storage of honey. Now you've got to look at hives and look at the frames and you've got to make this judgment. Is this comb really worth saving? Just because it's drawn out, if it's got more than five, maybe 8% of drone, It needs to be replaced and put new starter strips in there or new sheets because good worker cells make more honey. You can always get, if they need drones, they'll make them down towards the edge. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, Ed wants to know, when do you stop feeding dry sugar? Pretty much when they stop eating it, right? (laughs) Dry sugar is usually a method that you use from about November to maybe February. Once you know there's not going to be no definite big drops in your temperature, then you can start going to start feeding sugar water. The main thing of the dry sugar is to keep the moisture of the hive in the wintertime. Right, because that sugar will absorb the moisture and then they can eat it, they can eat it anyway once it becomes kind of liquefied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, John D. wants to know, is it okay to re- relocate bees during the winter? And, and John, let me... Uh, let me qualify that when when you say winter, winter to somebody in Georgia and winter to somebody in North Dakota are not the same thing. Let's let you say you're from Southern Tier, so let's assume you're in the Southern states, Don. And he wants to know if he can move a colony in the winter to a better location. I move them in the summer in a better location. So moving at the time does not make a difference. Uh, there's no way you're going to get 100% of the bees in that hive if you make a move. I don't care where you're at. Uh, I used to move bees in Florida, and we went down there at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning going around with uh, screens, screening all the entrances up so we have all the bees because it was in there at night. And then we'd go out to restaurant in the morning, have our breakfast and stuff, and go back and start loading trucks, you know, around 7, daybreak, or maybe just a little after daybreak. And we would find clumps of bees hanging on the front. So, you know, that shows you that bees, once it gets to a certain point, darkness or cool, they'll hang in a tree in that. So, you know, as long as you've got a a cool day is a good day to move them. Uh, Or you can move them, you know, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, you know, an hour after dark. You know, you're not going to lose that many bees. What about in a – he's actually from New York, so – He's cold like it is here in North Dakota. What about moving a bee in the winter, you know, once they've gone into their dormant mode? Uh, could I move them then? It's probably not a big, not a whole lot of difference, huh? Well, see, here's the, here's the whole thing. You know, the, the type of bees that you have, the race, makes a big difference. I've got some here that's got some several different uh, genetics in there. And most of my bees will start flying. On a cold day, 43, 44 degrees, you're going to see a few bees moving, you know, coming out. But, you know, no matter where you are, them temperatures, you can move bees. You'll lose minimal amount of bees. The only thing I would think that there might be a down is if you if you break the, you know, you're moving them and you bump them too much and break the cluster and the bees fall down to the bottom of the box, 
and the queen freezes or something, that, that would be, that would be that, bad. That hasn't happened in all the years I've handled bees. And I have actually dropped hives when I lived in Ohio. And you'd be surprised what they can take. Uh, even in a, uh, a swarm in a tree, I've knocked them out of a tree and I've seen a cluster four and five inches in diameter hit the ground hard like a football. And you go over there and go through it and the queen is perfect. Those bees encompass that queen as it's a cushion like when it hits the ground. They'll give their life up for that queen. And in the a, in a winter time, if you drop the hive, the maximum they're going to fall is four or five inches. And they're so thick between two frames, there's not that much movement there. So it's almost, you know, anything's possible, but I've had beehives in midwinter, a row of them get tipped over out in the back here. You know, I've got them on stand sometimes 15 hives to a row, and they're on a slight hill, and a deer starts rubbing antlers on it, and they push over a whole row for you. I've gone out there and scooped them up, put them back in boxes. You know, sometimes you lose a few, but the majority of the time, it don't hurt them. They're more resilient than what people give them credit. Right, right. Bees have been around for trillions of years, so right. you know, and uh, they didn't they didn't have our help to help them. So, uh, like you said, they're a lot smarter and more hardy than we give them credit for. I guess Jim is right. off making some more money. Yep, he's probably out there making us getting ready to build some boxes or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's he's. Uh, did he tell you how he's doing in Texas over there? What he's doing? No, not offhand. In Texas, I, I'll, I'll run it by you real quick. In Texas, uh, they're breaking a lot of that land up out there, and they're making little ranchettes. And they've got a thing out there that you get a uh, ag exemption if you've got bees or cattle. And for five or ten acres, not enough for cattle. So these people are getting uh, nukes out there or beehives. And Jim is really, you know, booming out there. He's taking nukes, buying them here, taking them over there, and. He's marketing for 350, and then he has a what he calls a maintenance contract, and he goes there and works them two times a month, pulls the honey, and does what he has to do. So he's built him up just like a, a route to go out and work the bees. So he's a busy man out there. Right, and then and then they get like a you know big tax deduction or something, don't they? Or do almost, they get a grant? Almost complete write off. And see, he's done uh, I think several videos out there where he's bought uh, or had bees out there, you know, from Texas. And they're real Africanized, and he'd be wearing one bee suit, sometimes two bee suits. And two years ago, he come over here, and he had bought a bunch of my nukes, took them back there, and he did videos again, but he's in shorts this time and a T-shirt. So the bees are more gentle, and that's one of the selling points out there. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm – into that for Arizona too when I go back uh, I won't be going back for another three or four years but I kind of want to make my you know make my mistakes up here in North Dakota make small mistakes that don't cost me a whole lot you know with a couple of hives and whatnot learn how to do splitting and all that stuff and then when I get back to Arizona I'll be limited to selling in the state because I looked up the bee laws like you said Don and uh, because of the Africanized bees Right. It's almost impossible to export bees from Arizona the way they've got it locked down. Um, but in state, Arizona's a big place, and they're doing that ranchette thing too, you know. And and there's a lot of folk that are moving out to the desert because they want they just want to get away from they want to grow their own food, you know. They're they're really interested in this kind of stuff. So that might be a viable option is to set up uh, kind of the schwans of beekeeping, so to speak. <laughs> it sounds like what he's doing over there in Texas. I planted that idea there. Now, what you got to do is talk to Jim there, and he can fill you in on what is going on. Right now, you know, bees are hot. Uh, there, there's more things on the news about people that want to get into beekeeping. There's more people that want to raise their own stuff, their own vegetables, and they find out right off. They got to have bees for pollination. So it's an ever-growing business, and if you got that ranch et deal and ag exempts in Arizona, I mean, you could set up the same thing. There's a lot of people want that ag exemption. They don't want to do nothing for it, but they will pay someone to come there and manage that hive or four or five, ten, ten hives, whatever, you know. And right. so you do it once, twice a month, and you just set your route up, go around and do it. It'll well, you know, and if, if you're getting a, 
a five or ten thousand dollar tax write off and you pay somebody two thousand dollars a year to run the bees, that's still a net eight grand for you, you know, and you don't have to do anything. You know, right. that's yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of ways to make money in beekeeping. I mean, out there you could set up a little school. That's what Jim's doing. He's setting up the school out there to teach beekeeping too. So there is a lot of avenues to it. Well, I'm a I'm a couple years from having my house paid off out there, and when I do, I'll have a lot more free time, and and maybe I'll come out and get trained, and then set up the uh, the you know the the Don. Co- How do you say your last name, Kuchenmeister? Kuchenmeister. Like Kuchenmeister. Apple Kuchen. Yeah. Okay. You need to go over and see Jim. I mean, he's right there in Texas. I yeah, I will. Up in North Texas. I mean, I've got people all over. I got a couple up there in Kansas City. All right. Well, guys, any more questions out there? It's going on nine o'clock, so I guess we'll wrap it up if there's no more questions. I guess everybody's bashful. Yep. Yep. Maybe I think they they come again. Better. They got to unmute their mic if they want to talk. They might be trying to talk and don't understand. Right. Gonna... Right. Yeah. You guys can unmute your own mic, or if you don't want to speak, you don't want to be heard, you can type a question in the chat. Either one. We got a couple of loud mouths, myself and Joe and uh, and Jamie. We're all uh, talking, but uh, well, I'm the loud mouth here too. <laughs> well, no, that well. You're the one. You're, you're the mouth that everybody came to listen to, though. <laughs> um, okay, guys. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up, Don. All right, Joe. We'll see you, everybody, next week. Uh, I should get an invite around uh, Wednesday or Thursday. The invite will come out. All right. If you can see if you can get that vi- other video. Yes, I- I'm going to finish that tonight. I'm going over to the other room and finish editing right now, and I'll okay. I'll post it up for you. Everybody, appreciate you coming. We'll see you next uh, next Saturday. Yep. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.